So uh, I'm Peter Meany. I'm one of the officers here, and uh, we're all volunteers. This is Kristen here, who is our president. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for coming today. Yeah. So, uh, so we're very excited. We have a, a great speaker today. Uh, there's restrooms in the back if you need. Uh, also, if anybody's interested in becoming a member, uh, that would be really helpful. It's thirty dollars for thirty dollars for a single person, forty for a family, and you can get cards in the back with that gentleman in the red sweater. But it, it really helps us. It's one of our main uh, funding efforts. So let me introduce Eric. Eric uh, Johnson. Here he is, hiding. Come on stage. So Eric uh, worked on his dissertation at Harvard, and he got he did a lot of research here. He actually made use of some of the stuff that we had, and uh, he's now a postdoc fellow at uh, Brown University in the art, architecture, and Native American. Native American studies. Native American <laughs> studies. Yeah. So he teaches there and he's doing postdoctoral work right now. So, uh, Eric, all yours. Yay. Hello, everyone. Uh, Hello, Eric. Thank you for coming. And thank you to the Pascock Historical Society, first for inviting me here, but also for all of the support that they gave me along the way for this project to happen. It really, it would not have happened without the Pascac Historical Society. So like I said, thank you to the Pascac Historical Society for having me here today, uh, and also for all the support that they've, they've provided me in, in, in my time researching in New Jersey. So in some ways, coming here is a bit of a homecoming. I haven't, I haven't been here in a, in, a, in a couple of years almost, uh, but between 2019 and 2021 or so, uh, Pasca the Pascack Valley and, and Bergen County in general was uh, a home away from home uh, while I conducted research. And it's so great to, to be here and see some familiar faces. Some people uh, in the room have quite literally welcomed me into their own homes over the years. Uh, and, and I'm really grateful for that. So today I'm going to talk about um, wampum making in Bergen County. If you don't know what wampum is, I'll explain that in just a bit. Um, but in particular, what I want to show is actually some new evidence. The story of wampum making in Bergen County, many of you might be aware of, uh, uh, but there are some things that my research uncovered that aren't, so, uh, that aren't very well known. Um, and that's really what I, what, what I want to share today. If you want to learn more, if things that I don't cover about this, of course, there's an exhibit uh, in, in the museum here where you can, uh, can, can actually see some of the artifacts that I'm talking about today. So I encourage you to check that out. Wampum is a type of shell bead that's important to Native American culture, society, politics, um, in the, and around the Northeast, but also where we are here today. And so, like, the story that I'm telling is going to be mostly focused on, this, on the 19th century, but because this is a part of Na Native American heritage, it's also important to remember that here in northern New Jersey, in southern New York, was and is a homeland of Muncie Lenape peoples. That is, uh, a Munsi being a dialect of the larger Lenape language family. Um, and these are histories, of course, that I'm going to talk about, which is a history of industrialization and, and, and a history of wampum making. But this is not just something that's in the past. It's also something that affects us today. And in the course of doing research, actually, I was lucky enough to speak with and dialogue with Chief Vincent Mann, who is the Turtle Clan Chief of the Ramapo Lenape Nation, who, for those who are unaware, the Ramapo are descendants of Munsee Lenape peoples in New Jersey. They are a state-recognized tribe. And as part of this research, we also, in the picture that you see on the left here, um, Chief Mann was able to have a ceremony to open one of the excavations that we did here 
in Park Ridge. And so on the right you see uh, Mayor Mishagna, and on the left you see Chief Vincent Mann. And there you also see that Chief Mann has brought what is actually a wampum belt to this ceremony. And that is something that I want to focus on today because that's really what uh, was the beads that went into weaving this type of belt were actually manufactured by settlers here in New Jersey. So, this talk is going to be basically three parts. I'm going to start by talking about phase one, the kind of early period of wampum making in Bergen County, and, and that's what I'm calling a cottage industry period, from after the American Revolution all the way up until 1850, and potentially later, uh, around the Civil War. Part two is then when we see changes start to happen in the industry. And specifically, in part three, I'm going to talk about the ways that my research, archaeological research, into this industrialization, into the process of industrializing wampum making, what it reveals about some of what I, what I call the side effects of industrialization. Because industrialization provides lots of benefits, but it also uh, can have some unintended and sometimes negative side effects. So, what is wampum? Well, if depends on who you ask, but uh, if you if you whoever you ask will probably give you a different answer, and that's because wampum means many different things to many different people, depending on your background. If you ask an archaeologist, we tend to just describe it as a material object that is a purple or white tubular marine shell bead. So shell bead made from quahog or clam shells, the purple outer lip of quahog shell, and white beads uh, made from either whelk shell, here locally in the northeast, or other types of shell, which I'll talk about in a second. But um, if you're familiar with the 17th century history of, of North America, you might also think about wampum as a type of currency or a money. Um, and that's because in the 17th century, it was really central to the fur trade. Europeans exchanging beads with native people, the people, native peoples being the primary producers, makers of wampum in that period. But the Euro European exchange then facilitated the circulation of these beads as part of the economy. And European governments, for a short time, in the colonies, actually legalized wampum as a type of, of money uh, for in that period. Um, it's in part because there was a shortage of, of, of metal coinage in the, in the colonies at the time. But that is not just what wampum is. Wampum is a lot of other meanings, it's especially for native people. Wampum has sacred dimensions, it has social dimensions, you know, gifts at important life events, maintaining good relationships in the community, and it also has political dimensions. And the, the belt that you see in this picture actually was commissioned by U.S. President George Washington for the Haudenosaunee, or the Six Nations League of the Iroquois, to co commemorate a 1794 treaty. And, and this picture actually is showing the fact that the modern Onondaga nation um, still recognizes this belt as a treaty, as a document of nation-to-nation -nation, uh, communication about land and territory and rights and access to that land. So these are things that are still active today as, as treaty documents. And if you'll notice, this, this was commissioned in, the, in 1794. And it's very possible, given that date, that some of the beads in this belt might have been made here in New Jersey. Now, I'm not 100% sure about that, but it is certainly possible because it's at that time that the bead, be, that bead making in Bergen County is really flourishing. So, part one here for some background on 
wampum making in Bergen County doesn't actually begin, the story here doesn't actually begin in New Jersey, but in fact begins on an island in the Caribbean known as St. Croix, today the Virgin Islands. And the story starts here in part because the raw material for making beads in Bergen County was actually coming from this location. So if you remember earlier, I said wampum was made from quahog or clam shells that are local to this area. Well, as early as the uh, mid 18th century, if not earlier, there are also, um, a com there's a commodity chain that begins in the Caribbean Ocean where the uh, shell of a mollusk, a mollusk species known as Lobatus gigas, that's the scientific name, uh, or conch shell. Some of you might, you know, recognize this type of this type of shell that you may have seen if you uh, if you if you've been to the Caribbean or been to the the Gulf Coast. Um, and this this we know this in part because of a letter that's actually that was recorded by a local Bergen County historian, and that uh, that a record of it exists exists here at the Pascack Historical Society archives. And I'll just read this here. It says, Dear Sir, I've purchased a lot of about 2,000 conch shells that I can sell you very cheap. They came in a transit vessel some days ago from St. Croix, and the captain could find no customer for them. He was obliged to get them off of his vessel. The captain says they're fresh from the sea, and he bought them of the divers as they came in from catching them off their boats. They're the handsomest lot I've ever seen, large and free from worms, perfectly sound. It's a letter from a merchant in New York to James A. Campbell of the Pascack Valley. Now, I want to take just a second to talk about the divers that are mentioned here. Um, because it's often, they're often not necessarily mentioned in the histories of the shell bead making industry here. But they did play a very important role. Now, we don't know exactly, exactly who these divers were but there's a pretty good chance that these divers were actually Afro-Caribbean in, in, their, in their ancestry and ethnicity. That means that basically they, either they themselves or their ancestors had been trafficked from Africa, the west coast of Africa, to the Caribbean as slaves, or depending on the time and the context, they might have also done this labor in the, in the context of being free as well. Um, it, it, you know, it just depends. We don't necessarily know, I don't necessarily know their names, the people that are referenced in this, in this letter, but we do know that Afro-Caribbean divers were well known for their skills in being able to hold their breath for extended periods of time, dive down deeply to the bottom of the ocean, and harvest materials like conch shell or pearls or other types of uh, shell, bring them to the surface and then either sell them themselves or uh, provide them to their owners. So, from there, the story continues from the Caribbean to New York, and then from New York to the Pascack Valley, which is where we are today. And it's here in the Pascack Valley, if you look closely, you might find in your backyards if you live around here, a Caribbean conch shell, as we can see in this image on the left, which is a place, which is one of the sites that I'm going to talk about in a second. Now, these bits of shell that you see in this flower garden, they were, they're not, they're not a uh, uh, ornamental uh, gift from, from the Caribbean from, you know, from last year. These have been in the ground since the mid-19th century. And I'll explain well, how we know that here in just a sec. But I also want to just position us in place here. This is a historic map from 1861. I think there might even be a copy on the back wall here, so feel free to take a look at it if you want to try to you know, find where your house was in, 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 this, in the 19th century, if you live around here. And there are a few sites that I want to point out. First, the Campbell factory which is located on what's today the Park Ridge High School property, abutting the Pascack Brook. I'm also going to talk about the Demarest store, uh, from which we have uh, ledgers. 
And as well, we're going to talk about the David Campbell house. I'm not going to point out the exact location of this house, just to respect the privacy of the property owners, but it's somewhere here in the northern Pascac Valley. <coughs> so, here at the Pascac Historical Society, there are a set of ledgers from the Demarest store. Um, and if you look at these ledgers closely, they basically, it might be difficult to read, especially the handwriting isn't necessarily the neatest, but um, if we look, analyze this page of the ledger, we can see uh, David Campbell, his name written there at the top of the uh, entry, and September 28, 1844. So, in 1844, David Campbell goes to the store and buys some tobacco, some dishes, and on the right-hand side, you can see um, basically the uh, credit line of the ledger entry on the far right. That's how much these goods cost. And if you look a little lower, you can see that he's purchasing 25 conch shells, as with a K. Not, not the spelling that we use today, but it's pretty clear what that is. Uh, for This is pounds, shillings, pence here. And then he also brings with him something that's labeled as wampum. It's a little bit hard to read, it's spelled a little bit differently, but he's using that here in the uh, debit line of the <coughs> merchant ledger to pay for the goods. So we have credit line and a debit line. The short version here is that he's coming to the store bringing wampum beads to help pay for the goods that he is purchasing the store. You see, he comes back then at the end of the following month, October 30th, and brings what looks like 12,000 wampum, or individual beads, and then gets, pays his debts at the store with those beads. So you can see how these ledgers really uh, reveal the complexity of this micro-economy of wampum making. You, know, you buy the shell, you bring it to your house, and then you make the beads, you sell the beads at the store in the next month. Now, as an archaeologist, I'm interested in more than just the ledgers, but also the bits of shell that were left behind. I'll explain what these images are a little bit later, but for now, if you just notice, there's little white dots out here in front of this building. And there's bits of shell that have been swept into the corner of the factory floor. So this is the thing that I, as an archaeologist, am, am most interested in. And luckily, I'm not the first archaeologist to look at this. Uh, about 100 years ago, an archaeologist named Carl Schoendorf also did some excavating in this region. First at a site called Stoltz Farm, which is over in Hawthorne. Um, and, the, and the collections from that excavation are in the, at a museum in Patterson. And he also did an excavation of the Campbell factory. So these collections, the first step of my research was to assemble all of these museum collections, for everywhere from the Peabody Museum at Harvard, to the Smithsonian, to local history uh, here in, 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 in Patterson Museum in Bergen County, um, and then to try to understand what we know already. And what we know is, is, is really great. It's a, it's a, it's a, there's a contrast here between, on the left, Stoltz Farm is an earlier site uh, from probably 1770 to 1830, though we're not exactly sure. And on the right is where the Campbell factory uh, comes into play, probably after 1850 sometime. But you'll notice there's a gap in time between these two sites. And as an archeologist, I really want to know I want to understand the whole period between 1770 and 1900, but we're missing this, this time period. So, luckily, the David Campbell that's listed in the, in the ledgers is also living in the Pascac Valley um, exactly during this period, during the 18, 1810 to 1850. So this is, here's a, here's a historic photo of the house, um, and this is where I did uh, my own excavations uh, here in the Pascac Valley, a new site that had not been previously known. 
So <clears throat> when I first realized that David Campbell lived in a house here in, 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 the, in the Pascac Valley, I was able to find that house that's still basically standing here today, and I called up the, the property owner and I left a message explaining who I was, what my interests are, and you know, ask in case you've ever found any shell in your backyard. And uh, the owner, you know, graciously got back to me um, and said, she left me a message, she said, you know, I think we found some shell in our backyard, but I don't think it's the type that you're looking for. It's not, it's the, it, the what you're welcome to come by and, and see. So the, 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 the house owners were uh, some of the nicest people that I've ever met, and I've been, and I'm really grateful for being able to work uh, on, the, on their property. Um, and as soon as I walked around the property and took around, I look, over, look around, I saw immediately that there are Caribbean conch shell, uh, scattered bits and broken, bits of broken shell scattered all across, particularly the garden areas of the, of the property. And to me, that's a smoking gun, especially because um, the owners admitted they hadn't been to the Caribbean recently, but uh, it's been probably sitting in there since the 19th century. So from there, we did a, uh, a systematic survey of the property. On the left-hand side, you can see a series. This is a representation of the work that we did. All of the little crosses are smaller test units, test holes that are around to sort of see where a shell might be located. Is it concentrated or is it spread out? And then the squares are where we actually put in excavation units to sample for that shell. And you can see on the left, there's a bit of, it's like a, a, it's like a heat map um, where the white is where shell is more concentrated, is more dense. And then the gray areas are where there's less shell. So that's how we decided where to dig. And we didn't just find, well, we found a lot of shell, which is great, but we didn't just find shell. We found other things as well. Things that are probably best described as uh, household trash from the 19th century. Uh, broken bits of glass, pottery, rusty nails. Um, and in particular, the pottery is, is, honestly, this is one of the best sites I've ever worked at because um, it told a very simple story. And that story is that the, the pottery you see on the bottom left here, we can identify the types of pottery and then use that pottery to then suggest when the shell was actually being worked. And so when we, we, we did all this quantitative analysis of all of the, of all of the different uh, ceramic uh, pieces, and, and it was very clear that all of those date precisely to eight, from around 1810 to 1850. And that's also the time that we know David Campbell and his family were living at the property. So it was, yes, it was, uh, the site was very cooperative <laughs> with, my, with my basic uh, research questions. Uh, and and, and it, was, it was truly a special place to work as well. So you might be wondering, how does one make wampum? Or how did uh, settlers in, in this area manufacture wampum? Well, it's basically a story of reduction, where you take a large, in this, a cock shell in this case, and then you break off bits and pieces of it until you're left with a small blank, or just a, you know, a, a tubular piece. And you can shave down the edges with a foot-powered grinding wheel, at this time especially, um, and you then uh, drill that bead. Uh, we know this was probably done with a bow drill. It's a little bit like if you've seen people try to, you know, start a fire with a, with a, with a you know, with a bow, um, it's, it's a little bit like that with a spindle and a, and a uh, drill bit attached to that. And then you have this breastplate where you can press up against it and then drill the bead by hand. And this picture is um, accurate. I think it actually comes from this book or, or, or an edition of the book over there, The Story of Wampum. Johnson Storms. Um, it's accurate in the sense that we know this was mostly done by women in the area. So Barbara and Howe are a couple of uh, historical chroniclers of the of the of Bergen County, 
they're, they're wandering around, they're documenting the industries and the population, and they come to Bourbon County and they say, wampum has been manufactured by the females in this region from very early times for the Indians. Operation of boring or drilling is most difficult of all. The peculiar motion of the drill is re it, rendering it hard for the breast, yet it's performed with a rapidity and grace, interesting to witness. So I, I think this quote really, really shows the, the way that there's, there's a highly skilled set of artisans here in this region. This is not just something you can do with like a, a hand crank or something. It's a difficult and skillful act. And it's mostly performed by women. So if you mentioned, I've been talking about a lot about David Campbell in this talk. And David Campbell's name is in the Merchant Ledger at the top of the, of the page. But in fact, it may have been his wife, Hannah, who was doing most of at least the drilling, if not other types of work, or perhaps even their, their children as well. But that's not all. So going back to this map here at the Demarest store, we also see uh, a man named Peter Sisko, who's selling fi finished beads and purchasing things at this store with, with wampum. And if you look up the name Peter Sisko in the 1850 census, you will find a Peter Sisko who's listed as a 31-year-old man who's also black and has a family of four, a family, a family of five, his wife Jane, uh, and his profession is listed as wampum maker. So this is really significant. I mean, David Campbell, he's, he's listed as a farmer, or he's listed, uh, I can't remember exactly, but farmer or laborer is usually the typical profession that's listed in the 1850 census. Uh, but here, the documents suggest, at least for this family, at this time, wampum making was enough of an industry that it could provide uh, a sustainable lifestyle for this uh, this black family of five. In the context, they might have been, you know, Peter Sisko may have been given this time period. He may have been born uh, as a slave, and at this point, he's free. He's also listed on this map. You can see P. Sisko here. He may have even owned property as well. So it provided a lifestyle for a range of different people, and that's something to remember. Because um, he's also not the only one in, this, in, the, in the ledgers who is likely black. Okay. So, things start to change around 1850 or so. And that is, before this time, this is a primarily a cottage industry, you make the beads in your own home, and then you sell the beads yourself at the store. Maybe you're even able to negotiate well, how, much they, how much you can get for those beads with that merchant. Um, but around the mid-19th century, a family of four brothers in particular, who are the nephews of David Campbell that I talked about earlier, these four brothers begin to establish what's called the Campbell Wampum Factory. They invent a drilling machine, which I think you can see here uh, at, the Pasca in, in, at the museum. They also build a two-story structure along the Pascac Brook. The reason why they built this structure is to install a water wheel. And this water wheel was then powering four grinding wheels. So if you remember before, the grinding wheels you have to power by foot. Now we have water power that can do it automatically. And so, apparently, you could, with this drilling machine, drill up to six beads at a time just with a simple hand crank. And the beads also begin to diversify at this time as well. They're not just making wampum, they're also making something called hair pipes and moons. These are beads that become iconic, particularly of Plains native uh, regalia. And there's some images on the bottom there that, that depict some individuals who wore these types of beads, as well as a photograph um, of a Lakota woman who has a hair pipe shawl, for instance. And these, I point that out because while I don't have enough time to talk about it today, these beads, despite the fact they were made in New Jersey here, they also have lives of their own on, on, out west. That's maybe a part two of this talk. Maybe I can come back sometime and give a separate lecture about it. But for now, it's important to note that in the factory, unlike 
working at a household, the cottage industry, the Campbells were also instituting wage relationships, which is a new thing that emerges with industrialization. And what I mean by wage is simply that, well, you know, you walk into the factory, you have a boss, and then he pays you for your time working in the factory. And we know this because there's Campbell ledgers, I think this one right here, um, that note people like James Williams, who on June 30th was paid $2 for, quote, grinding pipes, in this case, hair pipes that I mentioned earlier. Well, who is James Williams? Well, if we dig a little deeper into the archival record, it suggests that the people working in the factory were also not necessarily white. Um, it's hard to say exactly who they were. I mean, James Williams, if you look up the name in the, in the, in the census, it's, not a specific, it's hard to t pin him down specifically, but that last name was common for many black, people that are labeled black and mulatto in the, in the census. And in addition to this quote here that suggests that there were four black workers working the grinding stones, uh, there's another newspaper article that suggests that the workers, quote, say they have Indian blood in their veins. So I don't know ultimately who was working in the factory and what their, who they were in terms of their identity, but it suggests that at least they were black, indigenous, or Afro-indigenous workers in this space. And that's what I think about when I think about this... Um, image, I, I also try to think about it a little bit more like a, a, there's a, something, a, there's a bit of staging that's happening here because we have records that say that the, the, the people grinding the pipes were black, but we also have this image of these, you know, the Campbell brothers here. But um, I want to point, there's one person who's sort of bending over, who's kind of behind the protagonist of this image, and I like to think about that person that might be James Williams, even though his face is obscured. But um, that's just speculation on my part. So <clears throat> I want to now talk about the, what archaeology specifically can tell us about some of the side effects of what industrialization is, and then also what some of its side effects are. So the first, I'm going to have, uh, now I'm going to, I am going to show some numbers and data, some graphs and charts. So, uh, it, you know, it, it, if you're not interested in numbers, feel free to just zone out. And uh, I will also be providing the main takeaway for each slide. So I think that I have five takeaways that the archaeological data reveals that we didn't necessarily know for certain before this point. So the first takeaway at the David Campbell House, there's no evidence of hair pipes being made at that site. Now, why is that significant? As I mentioned before, um, the Campbell factory was, is a place where we do see hair pipes, a new style of bead. It's longer, it's more complicated shape, um, and it has a different set of consumers as well, uh, native consumers on the plains. Um, but we don't see that at the David Campbell House. And to be honest, I was actually surprised because I know that the hair pipes were in circulation at the time that the David Campbell House was in, in operation. Um, but what it suggests, and, and the fact that David is the uncle of the four brothers, so you'd think if the brothers are making hair pipes, perhaps David was maybe the person to start making these types of things. Um, but we don't see any evidence of that. And so for me, that suggests that the people working at the Campbell factory, they, they were specialty producers. And, 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 and they might have been one of the very few people who were able to produce hair pipes. They had a bit of a, a, little, a small monopoly over this wampum making industry. So the second takeaway here relates to industri what industrialization is in terms of um, the rates of production. How fast can you make things? And how much of it can you make? As, you know, we often assume industrialization you, you means you can make more things and it's potentially more efficient. You have a bigger economy of scale. And that seems to be true here. So at the David Campbell House, I've done all kinds of calculations with the archival and the archaeological evidence, and they were able to make 400 wampum beads per day. That's my independent measurement. That's also confirmed by 
other um, historical sources, that oral historical sources that say, oh yeah, they could make 400 beads per day, and that, should, and that in fact, that's true. Um, then that measures out to 4.4 kilograms of product per month. At the Campbell factory, they were able to produce up to 590 hair pipe beads per day. And that's twice as much, almost, uh, over twice as much product per month, or 10 kilograms. So this is, now they did not do this at all times. They didn't do this throughout the entire year. This is sort of a seasonal batch of production. They could make up to this much. This is, you know, think of this as a maximum. Um, and so the takeaway here is, in fact, industrialization meant more beads per month could be exported, both in the individual beads and also their total weight. And so there's, you know, there's more profits to be made at the factory than at the, at the Campbell House. Now the third takeaway here is, relates to the species who are actually making the shell in the first place, that is mollusks. Uh, quahog and conch shell, that, or conch that I mentioned earlier. And if we look at um, the three sites that I studied for my dissertation, um, on the right hand side there's a lot of numbers, don't worry too much about them, I'll just show the pie charts for you here. Uh, at Stoltz Farm, this is the earliest site, it's entirely made up of quahog shell. At the David Campbell House, we see then a shift where we see almost 89% in, in of it is conch shell and there's 12% of quahog. So that's a pretty dramatic difference in between these two sites. And at the Campbell factory, it's a similar, a similar ratio, perhaps even less quahog is found archaeologically at, that, at the factory. So why is this? I mean, you know, it's not cheap to ship a bunch of conch shell all the way from the Caribbean and then to, um, to, to Bergen County from there. Why not something more local like, like quahog shell? Well, and we know also that quahog was still, that purple beads were definitely in demand. It wasn't that the demands were necessarily changing. Uh, but here's a quote from the Campbells. There's an interview from 1888 where one of the Campbells says, Everybody wants the youngest clams they can get. They're called little necks. No matter how big they be, they've all died out. The young ones aren't allowed to grow up. So who here has had little necks before? Do you know what I'm talking about? This is uh, one of my favorite dishes, in, in the, at least in the, in the Northeast here. Um, these are basically, quahog clam is being harvested at a younger age so that it can be consumed by more people and the, the quahog isn't able to grow to its full maturity. And you see there's a picture there that shows how thin, in this dish, how thin the, the shell is when they're young. So it's hard to make a bead when, from a little neck than it would be from an elder quahog shell. Um, <clears throat> so, the takeaway being that we have declining quahog populations. Now, you know, that's not necessarily because of the, the Campbell factory, but it is, does relate to changing consumption patterns that are happening in the 19th century and potential over-harvesting of, of younger clams. And therefore, conch shell is a better, is a better uh, raw material to use. Okay, so for the next takeaway, um, I do have to explain one very simple archaeological concept. Don't worry, this is not an archaeology, you won't be tested afterwards. Uh, but there's a difference when, when archaeologists look at production, de production debris, these broken bits of shell left behind and thrown onto the soil, later to be excavated by people like me. The, there's a difference between routine waste. You take a shell, you break off all the pieces, this, the core of the shell that's left behind that you see on the left here, you dump that, and, and that's, that's routine waste. There's the same amount for every bead that you make. Now, there's a difference between that and uh, broken beads. And what I mean is that there are some bits of archaeological data here that they were meant to be a bead, but they broke for whatever reason. It's hard to know why exactly, 
but sometimes you can tell that it's broken while it was being drilled, or broke, or maybe it, you know, someone dropped it onto the onto the factory floor and it and it broke in half and, so, and it sweeps into the corner, later to be found by me. Um, so there's a, so keep this distinction in mind. Beads that were meant, or objects that were meant to be a bead that broke, versus routine waste. And here. Some more numbers, feel free to just look away, if this is too disturbing. But there's, on the left hand, you see very low numbers. That is, at Stoltz Farm and the Campbell, the David Campbell house, these are very low numbers of broken beads. I expected to find more, to be honest, when I was excavating at the David Campbell house. Because on the right hand side, you see at the factory, very high numbers, um, and that suggests that more beads, more hair pipes in particular, were breaking more frequently at the factory. So the takeaway here, very high breakage rates at the Campbell factory relative to these household uh, women, probably, who are doing the, the drilling before the factory. So this for me, uh, you know, it makes me question what efficiency means. And, and the reason why I bring that up is because there are many testimonials that suggest that the drilling machine was this, you know, invention that, quote, uh, meant that there was infinitely less anxiety for the producers about, about breaking, the, breaking the beads as you drill them. And J.C. Storms mentions that the drilling machine meant that there was a to almost total elimination of waste, which as an archaeologist and looking at the broken beads that were left behind, uh, I'm, I'm not co convinced about that statement. There might be some, uh, m might be motivated reasoning here. <clears throat> um, but, you know, there's, there's a more complicated story. Feel free to ask me about it in Q&A. The last takeaway that I want to talk about here that archaeology reveals has to do with what it's like to work in a shell bead factory. Um, and what I mean by that is, if you notice here, this uh, bead grinder, there's a bit of a spark that's coming off of the, the shell as he places it against the grinding wheel. Um, well, that spark is probably represents the uh, release of shell dust into the air when you grind this material. So shell, going back to our mollusk friends, who actually are the ones who made the shell in the first place, right? They swim along, or they crawl, it's the conch shell, they, they crawl along the sea floor, and they, 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 they soak in calcium ions from their environment. And through this amazing process called biomineralization, they take those calcium ions and they filter them into a durable, <coughs> polymer, that is, their shell. Uh, but those calcium ions, when you place them against a the grinding wheel, then also release into the air as dust, basically. And that dust, or calcium carbonate particulates, uh, I can measure using the archaeological data here, thinking about the thicknesses of the, of the different types of the different types of uh, objects and, and how much was how much of it was ground down and depending on the type of the bead and basically for every hair pipe that was made in the factory there was about a half of a teaspoon of this shell dust that's released into the air when you're working in this in the space now if we look at the rough size of the factory the probability that you know, okay there are some windows depicted in the background but if it's you know if it's cold outside are those windows open are they closed we're not sure but if they were closed that would mean that you have 7,000 milligrams per meter cubed of shell dust that's released into the air when you have all four grinding wheels that are working in per day this is sort of like assuming like an eight-hour work day so today's modern workplace safety regulations, or OSHA, suggests that you shouldn't have more than 15 milligrams per meter cubed in a workplace like this without proper protective uh, equipment or, and ways to disperse that shell dust. 
So in short, this factory would not have passed OSHA regulations. In fact, potentially up to 500 times over the, what is the modern OSHA limit. Now, of course, the people working in this factory, you know, they didn't realize that this is this necessarily like harmful for their for their bodies. Um, but the takeaway here is that the people working in this factory would have been at heightened risk of silicosis. And so, for those who don't know, silicosis is a chronic and fatal lung disease where basically the passages of the lungs become slowly blocked by different types of uh, particulates, in this case calcium, calcium carbonate, and can lead to, yeah, uh, can lead to basically a life of very slow suffocation. Um, and this is something that touched an entire generation of workers in the 19th century, not just, you know, people in the factory per se, but people working in mines and other other industries at this time this is you know one of the one of the dangers that we now know about and now there are regulations of course that help you know mitigate some of that harm um, but it's something that you know when we think about the factory it's 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 another variable here that suggests a darker side of, of that story and I guess that's where I want to leave us today ultimately I'm sure that everyone has lots and lots of questions. Um, but when we think about the Campbell factory, when we think about shell bead making, it's important to remember all of, the, all of the different things that were going on at that time in American history. And that, that relates to, of course, histories of slavery and how that affects the populations that are living in New Jersey at that time, histories of Native Americans who are using these beads, which again, I'm happy to give a second talk at some point about all of that. Um, but also for the local residents here that are that are entangled into this industry that has it has pros and cons um, and and hopefully this this talk has kind of made us think a little bit more about what those pros and what those cons are uh, for the Campbell factory so thank you very much it's been my pleasure to share this research. But, there are a lot of people that I have to thank for this. I'm not going to list everybody's name, and this is not a this is not a comprehensive list. But um, most of all, I'm I'm thankful for the Pascac Historical Society today and for supporting me in this work. So now I think I can open up to questions. Yes. Yeah. Raise your hands if you have a question. Just going to take a sip of water real quick. <laughs> Okay, I guess in the, the front row, yes. So, well, the weight of production in the um, David Campbell house and the factory, did that mean David Campbell's work would have been all taken away, or did that mean he still had some of the left? That's a great question. I think if I understand you correct, yeah, I'm going to repeat the question. Yes, um, but correct me if, if I'm if I'm in, if I'm wrong. <clears throat> the question is whether the emergence of the factory would have taken away David Campbell and his family's livelihood as they were not. A, is that is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's difficult to know. We do. I do. I will say that. Household wampum making continued to take place beyond the factory, even while the factory was in operation. Um, but my my guess is that there would have been less household production happening. And why that is, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but it could have something to do with the fact that the Campbell factory was able to make hair pipes, which is a new specialty good that was in demand, um, and that uh, that the other the household the other households who were not part of the factory weren't able to make hair pipes, or at least that's what the, that's what my research suggests. There are a lot of changes happening at that time in in, in the Pascal Valley beyond this. So you know, there's suburbanization that's happening, and our trains are coming in, and you know, different industries are emerging, and, and so. Yeah, it's not just because of the factory that the other that the households were in decline. <clears throat> Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. 
yes, sir. Yes. Said on black. There was no lake in Woodcliffe Lake, and all the black lived there. Uh huh. And they were just right down the street from it. Uh huh. And they just walked up the brook, and they were there. Uh huh. Uh -huh. My father played ball with him. Uh huh. Uh huh. And turned his century. You know, and uh, that's why I say when you said you thought black was there, how to be black? We tell they work. Yeah, no, it's a great point. I mean, I think what the, at least my research into this area is suggesting that you know there's there are there are uh, quite a few recently free African American households in the northern Pascack Valley, in particular, um, that that isn't that that's not always recognized as part of the history of of, of this region. Uh, yes, a woman just behind there. Yes. The wampum spread in terms of the currency. How far afield could you go from Pascagoula? I know you mentioned the people, the Indians, mm -hmm. in the later part of the 19th century as having the pipes and trading. Mm -hmm. But how far was that recognized as a currency? I don't think very far. System? Yeah, I, I think you have to recognize. You first of all, you have to have contacts with. New York City fur trade merchants like Jane, uh, like Astor and, and, and American Fur Company in particular, um, and so and it's only through those fur trade merchants that they can, you know, realize the value of those beads on the plains and in the Midwest at, at this time at least. So if you were a wampum maker in 1830 and you tried to sell the sell the beads at a, a store in, you know, New England or something like that, you're probably not necessarily going to get uh, money for them. Um, but, I mean, I think it all depends on what, what, for each merchant store, whether that merchant store is going to accept wampum as a barter good. I don't, th I don't tend to think of it like a currency. I tend to think of it like a like bartering, because they're making other things as well. I mean, there's, there's people that make baskets and that sell baskets at the store. Um, it's not just wampum that's used beyond cash at the store. So the wampum would have been used as not necessarily barter, but ultimately as a decorative item. For native people on the in the Midwest and on the plains, yeah, they're not necessarily using it as a currency. They, I mean, you know, they might exchange it in different ways, but it's not a currency on the on the plains. It's, it has value, and it's used. It's worn. It's part of regalia. And like I said, I mean, that's an entirely different, it's an entirely different talk. But yeah. when you go to the Caribbean, people will sell you pipes, jewelry that's made that looks like one pipe. Oh, that's One interesting. Of the I didn't really know. Make, it's a cottage industry even now. Yeah, and it's still, a, it's still a cottage industry. Also for native people here, uh, especially in uh, New England as well, there are a lot of wampum makers, so you can go onto their Instagram and, and, and buy uh, wampum objects if, if that's what you're interested in. I'll just circle slowly this way here. Yes. So, I was wondering, did you find any evidence the whole factory, did it go year round or was it mainly sort of a winter thing? Because so many people around here were farmers and then they need something to do in the off season. Yeah, first of all, it seems like they didn't work unless they had an order, first of all. So they're not, it doesn't seem like they're kind of stockpiling a bunch of surplus goods and waiting for the order to come in. It seems probably that they're, they get an order from a merchant who's connected either through the government or through a private company, and then you know, they fulfill that order at whatever season. It's, and it seems, it seems like most of those did take place over the winter and that the, the, they weren't making beads all year round. Um, but I'm sure that there are exceptions to that as well. Okay. Yes. Right. Did uh, glass beads hasten the uh, demise of the wampum industry? No, there were glass beads circulating um, throughout all of these periods, from the 17th century into uh, into the 19th century. The demise of the Campbell factory, which I didn't talk about today, has more to do with the manufacture of bone bead. Uh, bone beads from the, the Chicago stockyards, actually. Um, <clears throat> so there's another company that basically outcompetes the Campbells, starts manufacturing beads from the leg bones of cattle at the stockyards, 
and then and then and then selling those uh, on at through at reser in, into the reservation era, the early nineteenth century or the early twentieth century at that time. Yeah. Why Park Ridge? Why Park Ridge? Gosh, yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> there, any answer I give is going to be speculative. First of all, um, we do know that. Munsi Lenape people were living in and around the Park Ridge, but it's today Park Ridge, in the like Hackensack area specifically. And um, there are some who are noted as wampum makers. So we know that there are native people making wampum in Bergen County-ish, that, that general region. And it's possible that the early settlers, whether those are Dutch or other the later, like the Campbells, um, are kind of uh, yeah, either learning directly from them, or there's maybe some element of coercion happening, whether it's coercion or cooperative, I don't, I don't know. Um, but so there is, you know, there's, an, there's, a, there's a deeper history of wampum making in Bergen County that goes beyond settlers. Um, but why Park Ridge specifically also might have to do with the fact that John Jacob Astor, who's the founder of the American Fur Company and, and becomes one of America's first multimillionaires uh, by, by managing these networks of exchange across the, across the country at that time. Um, he, in his early years, did a lot of exploring and traveling in and around the uh, North Jersey, Southern New York, Hudson Valley area. Um, and it seems like he developed some contacts at that time. But, and so, you know, he may have been the first person to say, order some, order some wampum from some local producers. And that just kind of took off from there. Um, it, it just it became known among, you know, government agents and, and comp pr com private companies. That, oh, yeah, you want to get wampum, you got to talk to the Bergen County people. It's not just here, too. There are, there's evidence of stuff happening in Cape May in the early, late 18th, early 19th century, I think, um, as well as scattered reference to, like, Irish... Irish wampum makers in Philadelphia and things like that. So, yeah. Um, I was going to continue walking with the, okay, right in the back there. So, we've talked about people getting wampum to the Demers store. Is there evidence that the Demers store then sold it to fur traders like Pastor? Is there any evidence of that? Um, I haven't found a direct reference of the Demers store specifically, but I. We do have evidence of other merchants besides the Demarest store. Um, the Zabriskies, for instance, is a big name in, in, you know, in the history of merchants in, in Bergen County. His, uh, they, they, they ha I have letters directly from them to the John Jacob Astor's for company. Um, so, so, yes, there's a bit of presumption that's happening here in terms of Demarest's relationship to New York merchants, but they're selling them to somebody, that's for sure. And is the Demarest store... Was that here in Park Ridge? And if so, was it, where was it? Uh, it's up where the, um, the fire department is in, in Montvale. Do you know where that is, roughly? Uh, there's a park there now. Um, and it's just kind of right around there. And yeah, yeah. Yes, sir, here. In 1950, I went to uh, school with a Billy Cisco. And he was, uh, he was uh, definitely a black American. Interesting. Yes, yes, that's a great point. Thanks for sharing. Yes, sir? That the air pipe making machine was a very secret process. Mm. He was afraid it would be copied. And they worked very carefully to keep it a secret so that others couldn't use it. <clears throat> a lot of it was done in Woodcliffe Lake on the second story of a small building where the daughters would run off 400 a day. Yes, that's a great point. I didn't mention that in this in this talk, but yeah, the Campbells are. Whenever you read interviews with them, they seem a bit paranoid about <laughs> uh, revealing the drilling machine to anyone with tips to prying eyes. Um, and you know that that's, that speaks to the fact that they were they were afraid that they were that their business was going to be taken over by a competitor. In, in the same way that you know their ancestors uh, you know competed uh, appropriated this type of bead making from. Native people as well. So, yes. So I've just always been curious um, if the wampum was made by the native peoples for the native peoples, 
And then now we have non-native people making it. Two-part question. Is it then considered counterfeit? And did, did they flood the market? You know, or, or you know, did they prefer one over the other? And did they flood the market, therefore devaluing or made no difference? Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great question. Let me see if I can explain. I mean, native people making, native people, yes, made wampum for and circulated it with among native people. But I think it's, too, it's important to remember too that, um, um, that the value of wampum for native people comes, more, comes from more than just the, um, its exchange value, per se. Um, and I think at this time in particular, the people that are consuming Jersey-made wampum, and I, I say consuming broadly speaking here, it's, it's more than just an act of consumption, but the people that are consuming Jersey-made wampum in like the early 19th century are people that didn't necessarily use wampum that much in the past. So, uh, this is like the Osage in, in the Midwest, uh, the, the Sock and Fox, um, the, the um, Lakota, um, and, and m many others who at that time didn't have necessarily a wampum a tradition of using wampum per se, but it becomes an important tradition in the, in the, in the early 19th century. So in some ways, I think I would, rather than say that the Campbells are flooding the market, I think in some ways the Campbells are kind of creating a new market uh, f for, for Native people in the Midwest and, in the, and on the Plains. I mean, they're also at that time coming into contact with Eastern tribes, like the Lenape, like, uh, you know, the Shawnee, like many others that have been kind of pushed West who do have a wampum tradition, and so there's you know, there's, there's exchange of, of traditions and, and things that are happening at that time. Uh, and the other thing is that in some cases the consumers are actually the United States government more than anything else. Because the United States government at this time is taking these strings of wampum and giving them at treaty, at, at, delegate, at, you know, at diplomatic meetings to tribes beyond just the Great Lakes tribes who do have a tradition of wampum uh, diplomacy and the United States government is using these beads to kind of signal good faith and to try to, you know, uh, smooth, smooth out the tensions and things like that in these negotiations. So, yeah, I guess I would describe it as the creation of new markets rather than the flooding of an existing one. And then no differentiation between the handmade and the... Yeah, as far as counterfeit, yeah, the question of counterfeit is great. Um, so... Yeah, well, it comes down to what does it mean for something to be fake, right? You know, if someone's flying an American flag that's made in China, is it still an American flag? <laughs> I was, that's my, that was my mom's idea, actually. I, I would just <laughs> cite her. She, 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 had that, she had that insight, not me. Um, I think that something becomes real when it becomes embedded in, you know, real cultural and... and ceremonial and, and traditional uh, practices, uh, whether or not it's made by Native people or not. Now some, you know, at the same time, you know, some Native people did see it as, Native people saw it as counterfeit or fake or not, you know, not real and that's because, you know, making wampum in many ways was a sacred act uh, for, at least in, in the Northeast. And so if you take away the sacredness of that creation, then, then yeah. It's not the same thing. Um, yes. Is there any documentation about the United States government having purchased some of this wampum? Yes. There is? Yeah, yeah. A senator from, I think it's in the 1830s, a senator from New Jersey uh, is, there's a letter that says, you know, it's like, that's like soliciting wampum from Bergen County specifically. So there's, um, yeah, these are, these are, there are outposts, there are governmental outposts that are emerging in the early 19th century in what is, you know, what's called the Old Northwest, the Ohio and Great Lakes type region, um, and the, the government agents are finding themselves in need of wampum for negotiations with various native nations, 
And so they contact a senator from New Jersey who then says, oh yeah, you got I'll, I'll get some wampum from the Bergen County folks. Um, Is it documentation? I mean, you can yeah. actually see the, the, the letter. papers of sale or whatever? Yeah, I haven't seen the original manuscripts of those, but they've been transcribed and put into, into texts about the, about the fur trade. Um, yeah. This gentleman wants. To yes, well, I was just okay. Yeah. <laughs> By all means, if I'm if I'm skipping over someone who's had their hand up, who's about to lose an arm or something, just let, let me know. Yes. Well, I, maybe I missed it, but I, I noticed you have a lot of hair. Uh, could you tell me what the origin of a hair pipe is? It, was it literally something or smoked or what? Yeah, not for not you not used for smoking, not like a pipe. That would be a, a different object entirely. And how was it worn? Or yeah, so they'd be a lot of different ways, and it depends on the time period, depends on the tribe, depends on the culture, you know. Um, but yeah, at a certain point, you do like put them in uh, in in the hair, like a to put hair through it and wear it in in your hair. But it can also be used as ear ornamentation, and later it becomes. I mean, I could I could show a couple of images here real quick. Um, actually, I think I just saved some of these. Um, so here's some sketchy versions of sketchy as in as in a sketch, not you know scary. But they're not they're not they're not. It's not a very detailed picture, but you can see these long tubular beads that are necklaces. They're also used as chokers. Let's uh, skip over this, and then most famously. Um, Breastplates on the plains, in particular. So, see a couple of examples there. Um, thank you. That's helpful. Uh, but, but most I should know most of the breastplates that exist uh, in like uh, museum collections or that have been from this area or from this time period are also made out of bone. And that gets back to this: why the Campbells were outcompeted. They're outcompeted by the bone bead manufacturers. So yeah, like I said, there are a lot of different ways to wear hair pipes and whatnot. But these examples are later than the ear ornamentation or necklaces or chokers. And there's there are also delegation delegations to Washington that are using hair pipes to cite their you know on their their indigeneity and their um, sovereignty over certain areas of land. Okay. Um, there was a. The, you, did you have a question? Your I hand was up earlier. Generally, do you feel like uh, your your research uh, answered uh, the questions you set out to to answer in terms of filling in the historical gap and what open questions might there remain in this, in this realm? That's a great question. The question is, uh, did I answer all the questions that I had? And if not, you know, what questions remain? Uh, well, there's always more questions. There's always, <laughs> I always have more questions. So the art of writing a dissertation is actually deciding which questions you're going to answer and um, and then kind of temporarily ignoring the rest of those questions so that you can graduate on time um, the I would say I would say yeah and I would say I was honestly quite surprised I think and it comes down to the fact that the David Campbell house um, the data became so it was so rich it fit this gap in research it precisely almost in a way that you know I had written this proposal about, hey, there's this gap in research and they need to like, collect some more data to, to fill that gap, and, and it really was perfect in, in, in that way. My other questions, uh, I definitely want to know more about the um, you know, black wampum makers in, in Bergen County, um, just scratching the surface in, in terms of that story. Uh, and, um, and as well, I, I guess, my research in the future might might shift to other topics beyond um, beyond wampum making. That still be interested in New Jersey, but that's that's a we can talk later about that. Um, yeah, what, I think it's, I think I think some of the, I think uh, just to address the question a bit. There's some questions like regarding efficiency and 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 waste that I really wanted to answer definitively. That ultimately. Are more are too difficult, or some ways too difficult to answer f with certainty. Um, so even though you know, I suggested, I made some suggestions in the talk that this that the drilling machine was not as efficient as it, as it suggested. But I don't know that I can say that with like a hundred percent confidence. So, yes.
So, okay, yes, in the front row here. Was there any popularity in the Davis, I mean, in the Campbell factory that made it more, sell more? The popularity? of the factory itself or the goods that they were producing? Both. I don't know, I don't know if I would describe the Campbell factory as, you know, popular per se. It definitely is, it, became, it becomes a, um, an icon of, of a, a enshrined in the history of Park Ridge um, as, you know, as we all are here today, sitting in a, in, a, in a historical society with the drilling machine in the back, right? And so it, in the early 20th century, there's a real effort to make the Campbell factory into an important piece of Park Ridge history. So, as far as were the, how popular were the products that they made, I, it seems like they were quite popular among native people on the plains especially. Um, they're being traded as far as um, northern North Dakota and as far south as um, southern Oklahoma. So um, they're, they're circulating far and wide, and ultimately they become, and during the reservation era, so this is the period when Native Americans are from all different, sometimes from very different cultures and tribes are coming together, being forced to live on land that's relatively marginal, uh, and they're f having to find ways to survive and maintain their traditions, and in the process they invent new traditions, and they like come together, and, and what's described as sort of pan-Indian culture, things that like start to cross-cut many different tribes uh, everywhere from the East Coast to the, to the Plains, and hair pipes become a symbol of that. Um, and that's why you see them also today, like at, 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 at powwows or, you know, pipeline protests or, or what, what have you. So, um, yeah, I, I think they're quite popular, and they remain popular today. Yes. You haven't mentioned any of the southern tribes. Mm. Did they use wampum? I mean, they were closer to the source of the wealth shell. Yeah, and in, and in some ways, some of the... So beyond hair pipes, I mentioned earlier the um, moons. Moons that are these crescent-shaped pendants. And those are very much copying southern um, native adornment styles, ones that go all the way back, you know, into, into the ancient past as well, um, and that, uh, yeah, that, there's the, that, that use, that specifically use conch shell. I was not, I haven't, it actually, this is a great question for future research, honestly, and, and I'll follow up on this previous question, because it's something that I didn't necessarily have the time to focus on, to see, okay, are some of these things being sold to southern tribes who at that time are also, this is after the period of Indian removal. So if you remember Trail of Tears as part of the history of, of American, uh, Jackson, in the Jacksonian period where the southern tribes were forcibly removed um, and then lived in, in Oklahoma. And so they are living in the area where these beads are traded, but I haven't done enough research to know exactly if they're like a targeted market per se, but I, I, I would say probably, I guess. Yes. I'm uh, interested in the fact that at that time period, 18, 10, 20, when we're getting the cottage production, mm -hmm. women are now no longer needing to spend thread mm. at home. Mm -hmm. They can start buying thread and, mm -hmm. and go on into mm -hmm. a couple decades later, they can buy fabric, so they're no longer spending a great deal of time in textile production. I should have had you on my dissertation committee. <laughs> That's a great. That's a great point, and when I hadn't, I hadn't. I mean, I, I, I realized there were definitely changes. I understood there were definitely changes happening with the textile industry that are transformative in all parts of society at that time. Um, but that's a great point, and very well might explain some of at least some of the. Yeah, there's a opening in the kind of uh, kind of labor market, household labor market, that allows women to take up this this new craft. Uh, I, uh, I, I have a home out in Wyoming, in Blue Boys, and uh, we hike up into the Absarokas, <clears throat> and uh, there are large ant mounds, red ant mounds that take place, and uh, when you see a burial site, 
Uh, you know it by the ant mounds because the beads will come up with the ants. The ants huh. will take the beads out and drop them off. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. It's interesting. Uh, I have a tree on a property that's estimated between 2,100 and 2,700 years of age. Wow. And the Shoshone used to come in and put crystals underneath it. Mm -hmm. Sheep, sheep eaters, as they were called. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh, basically, uh, you watch the ant hills, and it'll tell you a great deal about what's going on below. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, there are archaeological examples of these of, of shell beads made in the Campbell factory that have been found uh, in the West in, in this, at this site I mentioned earlier, Fort Union, um, which is uh, a little bit around where the Battle of Greasy Grass or Little Bighorn took place. Oh, I don't know where. Okay. But up in, yeah, up and around the uh, northern, northwestern North Dakota at those fur trading sites, at those trading posts, there's been excavations of those and they found, you know, Campbell factory shell beads there. So, yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, you may have had this data up and I didn't see it, but um, I know you had spoken about the broken beads at the factory and that number was larger. Was there a percentage of the amount made that that represents or is that a question that you still have? You're not, sh like you're saying it's, lar it's a larger number for efficiency, but for effectiveness. That's a great point. And that comes down back to like, oh, how, how, confidently can we make this argument, right? And that's why, for me, do these, does this routine waste, the stuff that we collected, the sample that we collected, does that accurately represent the total amount of stuff that's happening at the site? And usually archaeological methodologies are very concerned with that, and that we sample very deliberately, at the site at the at the David Campbell house we, we chose locations very specifically to try to get a representative sampling of all of the material at the site so I would say that the David Campbell house material here on the left hand side is we feel I feel pretty confident about that um, the one caveat is maybe they were drilling the beads at a different location maybe they were drilling the beads at a house down the street or something and that's why we're seeing not so many uh, broken beads. But we do see a couple, right? And so, okay, it's at least something. And, and I think it's notable, too, that the ratios between these two household sites are similar. I didn't expect them to be that similar um, in terms of both being quite low. Um, and then, finally, yeah, I, the, the problem with the Campbell factory is that that was not done systematically, so I, I have I, I could I would I would guess that some of the data is missing there, but there has to be a lot of data missing for it to tell a different story. If that makes sense. How, how did you get interested in this? How did I become interested in archaeology? Ooh, does well, archaeology oh, yeah, and yeah. wampum. Yeah, and wampum. Uh, well, actually, so the in terms of wampum, this. Um, um, the Campbell factory that Schoendorf, the archaeologist that excavated the factory, he sold some of those uh, collections to the Peabody Museum at Harvard, oh. where I was doing my dissertation at the time. So this began as a just a, a class paper in graduate school, where I was like, oh, this is interesting. I mean, because I, I have been interested, I had been interested at that time in looking North American archaeology, especially relationship between Native Americans and colonists and colonialization and, 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 and wanted to study that in particular and, and wampum is is, is a, a good thing, a good object to study for, to understand. Cuts across. Yeah. Cuts across these different cultures. Uh, and I realized that nobody had, in the process I realized that nobody had um, really written about it, at least in academia. There's been some local publications and right. some important stuff beyond that, but um, so, I mean, maybe people disagree, but it's just an infinitely fascinating yeah. place. Well, you see how many people are here, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, honestly, yeah, it was, it was enticing and interesting, and, and it piqued my curiosity from the beginning to the end, and still does, and still does. So, okay. yeah. Hold on, one, I just want to make sure that there's somebody who hasn't asked a question yet that I'm forgetting or, or missing. Yes. Uh, about that claim of reducing breakage. Yes. Was he trying to sell machines? 
No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Again, these things were never patented. Well, then was, was that claim that not making doesn't have the breakage, so maybe the price is going down on the fees. Maybe so. The, these quotes, these quotes, this, the, the quotes that you're talking about, um, at least the one from 1939 is from a local historian who's doing a reflection, who's reflecting on this past. So you know, th it's at that at that time the second quote there about an almost total elimination of waste that probably has more to do with um, you know wanting to think about this as a piece of pride as a piece of industrial pride in local history you know and and um, I wouldn't necessarily that it has because at that time the industry had been out competed and the, the factory had closed its doors by by 19 1900 ish as far as the other quote um, yeah I don't think that they're I don't think that they're using these statements to Marked it for marketing purposes, I think, um, because their contacts are pretty solid with at least the, the people that know them. So, yeah. But it's an interesting question. Yes? Uh, in the Campbell House, um, was Joseph Sisko, he was living somewhere else? He was living in a different house or he was living in that house? Or Peter Sisko, the black wampum maker, yeah. He okay. was living in a different, in a di at a different location than the David Campbell House. Yeah. Okay. Yes, um, I have a, a map of it. Um, I think that it is his house is no longer standing, okay. and that was one of the first things I looked into. Um, that doesn't mean there isn't any archaeology from that site, but it's pretty embedded in the suburban landscape of today, so it's hard to know exactly where this dot on the bottom there, P. Cisco, yeah. where that dot is located. I mean, I know if you can, we can put it on, the, on, on Google Maps and then find roughly where it is, but the house isn't still there. So okay. I have to knock on a lot more doors to figure out <laughs> what, to find that place. Okay, let's just take one more. You must be getting tired of talking. Uh, in the back, in the back, <laughs> the, in the red, yes, yes. I just hope that you're going to make your dissertation into some kind of a book ah. or some kind of pictures, because I'll buy a copy. <laughs> Thank you. I am, so right now, my plan is to take, I don't know, the, dis the dissertation is done and it exists and it's, you know, it's good, but it's not very interesting. It's from quite uh, dry academic prose. Um, and I am currently working on publishing articles in academic journals, just so that like other archaeologists uh, that work in this field and in this region are like aware of this and, and that it can be incorporated into that for that audience. But yes, I mean, ultimately, I am interested in writing a book about this. Um, you know, you would. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> well, maybe I need to write two versions of it then. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Eric. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.